Hey, hello everyone. Uh, uh, welcome back. This is uh, one or this is one more online session on Shakespeare uh, Hamlet. Uh, uh, the class is supposed to be taking place at the Islamic University of Gaza, but uh, because of the anti-coronavirus uh, procedures, the whole world is taking. Uh, we're doing it online. I hope everything is going to run uh, smoothly. And uh, today we're going to do Hamlet Act 5. Uh, scene one. Actually, we're not going to do the whole scene. It's just the first uh, part where uh, uh, until uh, the king and the queen and Laertes uh, show up to bury uh, Ophelia, we'll do that next week. Uh, but before uh, I do that, again, I want to remind you that please stay home, try to uh, take good care of yourself and try to take good care of the elderly people around you. And these are some uh, tips. Uh, that you can, I, I know you know, but let's uh, repeat them again. Stay at home if you, if you can, don't go out. I did this meme the other day to help you again, clean your hands every time you come back uh, using Hamlet to be or not to be, that is the question. Um, so you can spend the 20 seconds uh, to, you know, get rid of germs and stuff. Okay, uh, in this scene, uh, act five, scene one, we finally reach uh, one of the most iconic units in all of the world literature, not only in English literature or in Shakespeare or in theater. The moment when Hamlet finally gets to hold the skull, Yorick's uh, skull. Now, there is uh, a misconception where many people usually think that this is the moment Hamlet was soliloquizing to be or not to be. This is not a soliloquy. Hamlet holds the skull of somebody he knew uh, uh, when, he was, when he was a kid. We'll come uh, uh, back to this uh, in a bit. And in a very iconic way, he talks about death, what it means and life and how death is all is going to bring us to this status, no matter how great uh, we are. Uh, I want you to think when you go, when you finish this class, to, to, th to do this exercise just for fun. Uh, Google image Hamlet or go to Amazon.com and search for Hamlet. And tell me how many of these results, the pictures you get uh, or the book covers have a skull uh, on the page. Because uh, uh, personally, I think there are so many, so many of them, which is very interesting. Now, in act, uh, uh, in Act 5, Scene 1, we'll talk about uh, several issues, and I listed some of these important issues. We'll, we'll focus on the grave diggers, or the clowns, as they are called or the, uh, in, in, in our book. We'll, we'll talk about Hamlet's return. We'll talk about Hamlet's transformation, uh, and how he transforms, not like, like not, I'm not talking here, transforms in terms of what he wants to do, but philosophically, even spiritually, uh, we have a, a different Hamlet. We have a mature Hamlet. We have Hamlet who thinks differently about death. Now, uh, in these extracts that I, I got you from uh, one source I'm using, uh, we will see how Shakespeare himself is actually transforming this story because Hamlet was originally a story uh, of pagan uh, origins. Uh, probably long before Christianity. I'm not sure if uh, it was before Christianity, but the story itself was not a Christian story. But here we see how Shakespeare adding some kind of, uh, not only philosophical, but also a religious context to, uh, to this uh, tragedy. He gives the play a polish. We, talk, we see how people keep talking about God, about religion, how almost all major characters believe that after death, there is life, uh, there is another life. There is the hereafter, the day of judgment, a, div a divine, a divine uh, uh, judgment. In, in the play, we'll see also in this scene how Shakespeare generally uses simple uh, uh, props. He doesn't use like nowadays theater or stages that, that use extravagant uh, props on the stage. Uh, Shakespeare here uses the minimum. For example, again, the minimum that Shakespeare uses makes the whole play fascinating in more than uh, uh, one way. We'll see how usually this kind of interaction between, between the audience and 
the audiences and uh, and the players in in the way Shakespeare uh, uses it makes this uh, fascinating. Now, uh, this scene with with Hamlet carrying the uh, the skull is considered to be one of the most famous images or pictures or tableau of in the whole uh, literature. Like I said, in in, in a moment, it's a universally recognized uh, icon. Now. Uh, uh, Shakespeare did not invent this kind of reminder of death. He keeps talking about death. He's fascinated with death. We, we saw this when we discussed to be or not to be. We saw this when we discussed what a piece of work uh, is a man. But Shakespeare gave it this powerful expression. The language, the traumatization, the fact that people like Macbeth, uh, people like uh, Hamlet, like Othello keep talking about death in this fascinating poetic way makes death uh, wonderful, superb, and he keeps sending us reminders after reminders. Now look at this. In, uh, we're going, we know that this is a tragedy. The, the joke is that uh, <laughs> anytime, anytime you have a name of a person on a play, on the cover title of a play in, in Shakespeare, it means this person is going to die. So you just, there's no spoilers here. You know this is uh, a tragedy. We know this is uh, uh, a play where not only the main character, the title character, but also the, the major characters are going to die. But here, Shakespeare is smoothly taking us in, through this journey of five acts and so many, so many scenes. He's preparing us to this. He's preparing us to the moment that Hamlet and other characters are going to, uh, to die. So the tragedy here, uh, death is going to come not to all people, like mm -hmm. Paul Fortenberg mm -hmm. and Hamlet, but to a young person, to Hamlet. And this Hamlet, he's like our friend. He's like even our child. He, he grew with us, you know? We, when we first met him, he was all sad and melancholic. And then he grew up in this fascinating way to become a philosopher, to become the person we want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says, Hamlet managed to achieve the kind of wisdom as a result of his pain, as a result of his of his suffering like, uh, like what happens to, to us in life. So the audience here uh, has grown, has come to admire Hamlet and also probably to become Hamlet and identify, identify with Hamlet. Okay, so uh, uh, now uh, we, we, we open the scene with uh, two grave diggers, grave makers. Sadly, our book calls them uh, clowns. They're not clowns. It's it's they're more universally known as grave diggers or uh, grave makers. Uh, the two people are are talking here, and they are discussing uh, something that we ended Act Four, uh, uh, Scene Seven with. And uh, the thing is that uh, he, they're talking about uh, Ophelia's death, but look at they don't know the name. They just just have uh, the, the, the mission to, 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 to dig uh, a grave. The first clown says, is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? The second one says, I tell thee she is, and therefore make her grave straight, the crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. Now, remember we said, did Ophelia kill herself? Or was it just an accident? It could have been an accident. Uh, Gertrude made it look like an accident. Probably she didn't want to make, uh, remember, or uh, Laertes even angrier at Hamlet. She was protecting Hamlet. But uh, now we know for sure that she committed suicide. And there is evidence here. There's, clear evidence. With, with, with Lady Macbeth in, in Macbeth, we don't know whether she killed herself. There's no evidence that she killed herself or died by accident or just. Now, with Ophelia, we know for sure here in this scene, because people talk about this. And, and this is significant. To me, it's significant because Shakespeare wants to tell us that people uh, that women here in Shakespeare, in, in, in the Elizabethan uh, time, were so submissive, were so meek, so silent, so muted, that they couldn't speak. Remember how her father 
silenced her, her brother silenced her, Hamlet silenced her, how she was used and abused by, by all the men around her, how her life was destroyed by men. She couldn't speak, she couldn't answer, she couldn't question them. And Shakespeare is saying that. Now, Ophelia takes action. For the first time in the whole play, Ophelia takes action. But sadly, when she takes action, she can't do anything to the men around her except killing herself, except committing suicide. And this is uh, uh, a very interesting feminist perspective here. I'm not, I don't think, I don't believe that Shakespeare is anti-feminist, but Shakespeare is telling us that women were so desperate at that time that they killed themselves because men did not care about them because their parents, their, their brothers, the, 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 the men in their lives did not give them the chance to talk, to, to, to love, to live. And what these two people are, are discussing is the fact that she's going to be buried a Christian uh, a burial, given a Christian burial. And at that time, if somebody killed somebody or if somebody committed suicide, those people were not given proper Christian burial as some kind of punishment. But look at this, Ophelia, because she's a noble woman, the daughter of a noble, uh, and because the king is, remember the king wanted to, uh, to, to sound good, to, to, to do good things to Laertes so he could win him. So there is some kind of vasta here. <laughs> so Ophelia is going to be buried, and this is part of the political corruption that uh, uh, the second clown says here, I'm quoting, uh, will you have the truth on it? If this had int, if if this had not been a gentle woman, she would have been buried out of Christian burial. If it was somebody else, a commoner, a common woman, a common person, she would not be given this kind of burial. And this is the political corruption we're talking we're talking about. So we learn many things from this opening. Now the masses, the ordinary people who were mentioned so many times. We, we, when, when the king mentioned them probably three times when he said they love Hamlet, that they, they're not wise people, those people talk, they chatter. They talk, they gossip, and if you look at their language, let me go back, it's all prose because those people are not educated people. They're illiterate, uneducated, so Shakespeare uh, uh, typically gives them uh, uh, prose. Their talk is, we'll see how they're talk is peppered with puns and humor and fun and, 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 and social and political criticism as well. They're not as eloquent as uh, ordinary, as, as Hamlet and other educated people and noble people, but they can talk about the same issues in their own language. We'll see how uh, they provide us with a very, very comic and much needed comic relief after the death of Ophelia and how the king was poisoning Laertes to kill, uh, to kill Hamlet and scheming against Hamlet. And it's again giving us a break before the final scene where death and destruction is going uh, uh, to prevail. Now, uh, if you look here, uh, I want you to, uh, to again uh, uh, focus on this issue, the fact that this woman was given, uh, uh, Ophelia was given a, a Christian burial, uh, despite the fact that she committed uh, suicide, she killed herself because, uh, uh, because again, of the king. The king probably uh, ordered the, uh, the church, even the priests to, uh, the king ordered the priest uh, uh, to do something about, about that. Can you hear me again still? Can you hear me? Type yes. Okay. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't mute uh, those people making noise. I don't know how. Anyway, so uh, if you if you uh, uh, focus on this issue, if you think about it, Shakespeare was always very critical of the, what could be called the class division in their, uh, in their time, in their society. Uh, here we have a young uh, woman, a woman who committed suicide, but again, despite the fact that she committed suicide, being given uh, a, a 
Christian burial against the norms, against religion, against the church, only because she has a wasta, only because of the political uh, corruption. So I'm quoting here from your book, the rumors circulating in and around Ilzinor suggest that Ophelia killed herself. Still, she is being allowed a Christian burial. The grave diggers decide that if Ophelia had been a commoner, if she had been an ordinary person, if she's not related to the king, this exception to the rule wouldn't have been allowed. The age-old complaint of the poor uh, rings familiar. The rich have privileges that poor people do not enjoy. Birth and wealth provide power and create the rule, the true distinctions between, uh, between the classes. And this is an is uh, issue number one. Now, I want to give you the time to think about uh, the, the extract. I'm going to move to the second part. So the, the first part, how they are talking about uh, uh, about, uh, about Ophelia and her death and the class division here and how Shakespeare is criticizing, uh, criticizing. But those people give us a comic relief. We, we have more insight about the low class people. I'll give you one minute to try to uh, read, scan the extracts uh, here I'm quoting on the slide and tell me what you notice. Again, there is uh, here the first clown talking. Okay. Uh, can somebody? Can somebody read the first part? Somebody, please read. If you hear me, if somebody can unmute. Yes, uh, somebody read to me, to us. Unmute and read. OK, I can. OK, go on. See, often, often deal. It can't be else, for here lies the point. If I draw myself frittingly, it argues an act. And an act has three branches. Is It is to act, to do, and to perform. Argal, she drew herself frittingly. Give me a leaf. It lies in the water. Go on, go on. Uh, here stands the man, God. If the man go to, the, uh, to this water and drown himself, it is. Will he? Nil he? He goes. Mark you that. But if, but if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Argal, he that is not guilty of this own death. Shortness, not this own life. Okay. Uh, so this could be funny a little bit. They're talking about what death, suicide, how it happens. And this is a very simplistic, very interesting thing. In the second part, he says, here lies the water. Okay, if we have water here and somebody is standing there, if the man goes to the water and drowns himself, it's suicide. If the water comes to the man and kills him, it's not suicide. It's very, very, I, 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 I laugh, I, I giggle every time I read this because it's, it's funny. But I want you to notice the language. What, what do you notice about the language? What words are repeated? Anybody wants to say something? Unmute and say something. What do you notice? I, I think it's conditional. It's false of conditions. Argyll, therefore. Okay. So the That's proposing right. conditions. What else? What the, the language? It's well punctuated. It's well punctuated. No, uh, punctuations are very uh, something that probably Shakespeare uh, didn't follow that well. This is something all modern, all uh, changed. Uh, uh, if a man, if a man, it all examples. We're done with uh, conditions, uh, Alas, Move to another point. Talking about man, the examples is about man, not about woman. Yeah, man. In also, the, uh, the, the, the case here is a, is a woman. 
this, in the sense that this is probably because a man is what is used to talk about women. Uh, here it means human being. L the language itself. If you don't, if you can't read English, if you look at the language, what words are repeated? Lies. There are, yeah, lies. The word lies. The word lies is going to be repeated many times. Act. 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 Probably there is act, act also. Act. Acting, reminding us that this is. Uh, it's Performing. Prose. It's prose. The first thing you look in. We know it's a prose. You say that. The first thing you look at the text in a play in Shakespeare. You just said it. You, you, at the beginning. You need to tell whether this is prose or verse. And you need to know why. Those people are uneducated. They're not using poetry. So some of you said this. But I'm not sure if you paid attention to this. Muhammad Yassin wrote uh, Argal. What do you mean by Argal, Muhammad Yassin? Why did you write Argal, Muhammad Yassin? I mean, it's, it's repeated uh, the word and we have drum. What does it mean? Repeated. It means therefore. Okay. Now, but, I mean, okay. it's repeated. It's repeated. Okay, one of the words that are repeated. So, uh, so look, if you look at here, it means therefore, like you said, and there is logic here. If, like Khalid said, there is if, and then there is therefore. Now, in the book, a, a, I was reading just this article again, source, and how Shakespeare gives proper language to the uh, to the speakers, a prince, the language of princes, kings, the language of kings, the, the queen, the discourse of queen, uh, university educated people will speak a highly sophisticated language, but ordinary people will speak the messengers, the clowns, the grave diggers, the fools would usually almost always speak prose. And now the word argal, some critics say that this is, our, this is the wrong word. It's not argal, it should be ergo. And I'm, I'm going to type it here. Ergo is, is, do you use ergo? Have you ever used the word ergo? Uh, Abdullah, okay. Yes, I know. It's, uh, what does it mean, Abdullah? Yeah, I know. Abdullah, who type the word uh, ergo? What does it mean? It means therefore, it's used in English. Now, some people say this word is probably mistyped. Shakespeare wrote it, uh, ergo, and then later on somebody mistyped it. And people say, no, Shakespeare doesn't know much Latin because this is originally a Latin word. So. And remember, Shakespeare went only to a grammar school. So he wasn't well educated. He didn't know what the word is. Okay. But if you think about it carefully, uh, if you think carefully about this, uh, the, the speaker here is not an educated person. The speaker is a grave digger. He doesn't have knowledge, but he tries to show off his language. The first thing he used the word See offendendo. That's a Latin word. And he's using also argal. So what's happening here is that Shakespeare makes this man uh, speak this particular language. He's showing off. He's trying to sound uh, sophisticated and elite and posh and lofty. But he's using the, the wrong word. So instead of saying ergo, because he's not educated, he's using the word Argal, whatever that, that is. And this is one of the most genius things in Shakespeare. A point where, again, we always remember our friend uh, Marlowe and how he used language, uh, uh, poetic language for all, for all people. Remember, Shakespeare went to a grammar school. He didn't go to Cambridge or Oxford. And Ben Johnson, accusingly, said Shakespeare had little Latin. He knew little Latin and less Greek. But in today's term, don't forget, Shakespeare is extremely educated. And so the word argil here is a mispronunciation from the word of the word, uh, the, the Latin word ergo, which means uh, therefore, because this man is not educated, he uses the wrong language. He uses prose. He uses uh, uh, fragments. We'll see the songs later, later on. And this is a major departure from not only Marlowe, but other dramatists who preferred to give high, a highly embellished language uh, uh, to, to the characters regardless of their uh, class or education. Now, if you look later on, those people keep using puns. Here we have Adam was the first, that the two clowns are talking. Adam was the first that ever bore 
bore arms. You know, arms like guns. And now the second clown says, why? He had none. He had, he had no weapons. He had no, no guns. And then uh, the first clown says, what? Art a heathen? Heathen, like, are you an unbeliever? Are you a disbeliever? How dost thou understand the scripture? Do you know? Do you read the title? The scripture says, Adam digged. And could he dig without arms? And this is, again, one, one funny thing, because the word arms first means uh, uh, armed like guns. And then the other one is using it to mean uh, uh, digging and dig, uh, sorry, uh, using his arms. So there is here another play on words from these, uh, these, uh, uh, these two people. And then one, the second grave digger leaves and the first grave digger keeps uh, singing. Remember, he's in a cemetery in a graveyard. He's digging a grave. He is literally inside a grave but he's singing and he's singing about life about the stages of life he says in youth when i did love did love me thought it was very sweet to contract the time for a my behove oh me thought there was nothing meet but age with his healing with his stealing steps hath clawed me in his clutch and has shipped me into the land, Dro drove me time, stole the steps and pushed me to, uh, to the land, into the land. And he's literally in the land, as if I had never been, been such. Now, again, remember this, this scene is, is in many ways very contradictory. People are having fun, they're drinking, they're, they're making, uh, they're chatting, they're oblivious to death. They don't care about death, despite the fact that they are in a grave, inside one of the graves. And the idea here is that death becomes something familiar. To them, death is something familiar. So the songs are about the phases of life. The grave diggers, uh, digger here refers to Adam, and sometimes, and then later he refers to the Day of Judgment. Because a grave digger, the grave digger has been there from the beginning and will be busy until the last trumpet. The songs are incomplete. And this is funny. Sometimes when you read the text, you don't know. But when you read about it, you get to know the background. The songs are incomplete. They are fragments. They are half-remembered songs. And again, this is uh, Shakespeare being realistic. This is not an educated man. He's just a grave digger. So even when he remembers the songs, sings the songs, he doesn't sing them all. Shakespeare is being very realistic. But I want you to think of this. Is he, while he's criticizing high-class people. He's criticizing uh, Marlowe and those people who give a highly sophisticated language to all the characters. Is he also demeaning the poor? Does he mean that poor people are not smart? And don't forget that Shakespeare himself was not considered to be a highly educated uh, person. So when we talk, when you comment on, uh, on the, the singing, the grave diggers and the singing, uh, again, I'm quoting a source here that is really interesting that I like very much. The singing grave ma maker makes a profound impact on the audience and on Hamlet because when Hamlet gets into the scene, he finds a grave digger inside the grave and singing about love and life and making, you know, jokes. Uh, so the disturbingly happy, he's happy, but he's disturbing. Singing, because when you go to cemeteries, when you dig uh, uh, a grave, you don't sing, you don't laugh, you don't drink, you don't crack jokes. So the disturbingly happy singing man who cracks jokes as he works is amusing and terrifying because he is full of life, because he's singing and what he wants to drink. But at the same time, uh, uh, he is also so at home with death. He is literally inside a grave. And the idea is that the daily trade in de is dealing with, uh, uh, in dealing with uh, uh, what most of us would rather uh, uh, not think about makes death a normality, makes it something that is a habit to them because th this is their job to dig. The man is digging a grave 
for Ophelia to be buried, and soon he will be digging more graves for many more uh, deaths. And finally, we, even us, will all end up in one of these graves, whether we are somebody, important people, rich people, or whether we are nobody, unimportant people, poor people. The grave digger is the grand leveler. He is ageless, immortal, and superhuman. In many ways, he represents and symbolizes death. He is death itself. Do you want to say something, anybody? Please uh, comment. Uh, if you want to add something, somebody wrote something. Yeah, this is their job. It's, it, it becomes a habit. This is familiar. We call it familiarity, you know. Uh, familiarity makes uh, things, you know, normal. Uh, but again, in a way, Shakespeare is trying to normalize death, to make death look like something uh, uh, normal, uh, to make death look like, uh, uh, because he's preparing us for what to come. He's preparing us for uh, the last scene in the whole play when many, many uh, people are going uh, uh, to die. Somebody say something, please. I would say one remark about this. Uh, last lecture we said that uh, Ophelia dying of a stage is like to de de like uh, making Ophelia little or something not important. But now, what if like we omitted if we omitted this scene? It's all about Ophelia and her her funeral. Why it's so important? Why is Shakespeare making a, scene, a whole scene about like uh, the funeral of Ophelia? Because at the first place, her death is not important and is being off stage. No, nobody said, no, no, no. We didn't say off stage. It's un she's unimportant because it's off stage. Many people die off stage. Uh, it doesn't make her unimportant. But this scene is significant because Shakespeare wants to see how Hamlet is changing. But we have a different Hamlet. Okay? And at the same time, uh, Shakespeare wants us uh, to have some kind of a comic relief here, because those people are so at home with, with, with death. Those people are making uh, jokes, are playing with words, are making fun of each other, are challenging each other in a way. And, 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 and one of them went to, 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 bring, to, to get a drink. They want to get drunk in the cemetery, in the graves. Uh, okay, Zoom here is telling me you have less than a minute. 